Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you once again for another new week in our lives, oh God. What an honor and a privilege it is to be able to come together to learn and to study your word week after week. And Lord, even as we continue to learn about the local church that you have called us to be, oh God, we pray that we will learn that everything that we study, God, it will be deeply rooted and grounded in our hearts to bear fruit in each of our lives. God, we thank you. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we started with chapter 11, last class, right? We went a little bit uh, on uh, chapter 11. We talked about the church as an army. Uh, so we're looking at different aspects of the local church, right? Remember, we looked at the local church as a family. As a family, what do we do? What do we do as a family? Yeah, but what do we do? What do you do in your family? Yeah, I'm praying together. <laughs> but I, I, I'm looking for words that we went through this. What do you do as a fam in a family? What do you do? Okay. You love each other. You care for each other, right? So you see the aspect of caring and loving. And now in the army, what are we seeing? What did we talk about last class? In the army, everyone's on high alert, right? It's it's war. It's battle. It's not like, you know, it's not no more love and care. All of that is one aspect. And now we've come into uh, the church as an army, and we looked at a few verses where Paul is talking and he's saying, I've fought the good fight of faith. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, right? So bringing a sense of military, uh, spiritual militancy, meaning, now, when we say the local church is, a, is an army, it doesn't mean like we are physically an army. It doesn't mean we go and fight against people from other faith. That's not what it means. We are talking about spiritual militancy, to be on our guard, right? We know that the enemy, our adversary, is like a roaring lion. He wants to deceive us. He wants to bring us down. He wants to just, you know, crush everything that we stand for. That is why we need spiritual militancy. We need to be alert at all times. The enemy can use the smallest possible reason to get you and I away from God. He can use that. All he needs is a seed, right? So we must understand there is a natural realm, there's a spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, the word of God is like a seed. Yes? The seed is sown in good ground, it will bear fruit. Now, even the enemy is looking for one opportunity, one seed that he can sow into your heart. One seed he can, a seed of thought that he can put into your mind. It's very easy for him to do that. Now he's done, the enemy did it with Jesus, the Son of God. He put a seed. But the choice is ours. That is where we must be spiritually alert. You get what I'm saying? Right? We need to be spiritually alert. Imagine Jesus was weak. Of course he was weak. Physically, he was tired. He hasn't eaten for many days. No water. It's hot. And he's fasting. He's praying. Take this stone and turn it to bread. Satisfy yourself. Right? Just, just a thought. Satan didn't say, can you do it? Will you do it? Satan said, you can do it. Right? Take it and do it. A seed, a seed of thought. Have you, have you seen people who are in, uh, you know, people who go into depression, anxiety, uh, you know, people who go into um, suicidal tendencies? What is it? It's just a thought. There have been a small thought, I'm a failure. Just that one word, I'm a failure. Now, when you and I, for example, okay, you and I, the enemy says you're a failure. Ah, that's okay. We'll get better. We'll improve and do better next time. Some of us are wired that way. We'll move on in life. Right? Nobody, like, not everyone will go and start 
you know, weeping and moaning, lock the door, off the lights, or everyone will do that. There are some people, it goes deep into them. Even, even the hurt of losing a loved one, very painful, right? Some of them are able to move on. By God's grace, they move on. But the enemy can use those seeds to take us away from God. So we must be on high alert, right? Uh, so we are, as believers, must be trained in spiritual warfare. Last class, we talked about it. If you and I are going to war, if we want to join the Indian army, can we go and say, I want to join the Indian army? They'll say, okay, show me your fitness level. Go do a couple of rounds, do pull-ups, push-ups, everything. If I say I can't do, but I still want to join the army, they'll say, sorry, go back home. Do something else. So you and I are must be trained for spiritual militancy. When, when God is training us, he's also giving us weapons. First Corinthians, sorry, Second Corinthians 10, he said, Paul is writing, saying, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're mighty in God. So you and I are armed and dangerous. Can you, can you think of it? Think of it in the in your mind's eye. Think of it. Think of your of Ephesians chapter 6. You're wearing the armor of God and you're standing there. You know, uh, I read a book. I forget the author of the book, but he, this author said something brilliant. He said, when we put on the armor, an entire armor, the enemy doesn't know who he's battling. Have you seen the full Roman armor? Yes or no? Have you seen it or no? No? Right? It, it covers the face, the helmet completely covers. So we don't know who's the person. So this writer says, when we wear on, put on the armor of God, the enemy doesn't know who he's fighting. Meaning, it, 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 it's like we have put on the whole armor of God. And we are protected from the enemy. So we have spiritual weapons, the name of Jesus, the word of God, the blood of Jesus. Our position in Christ. I love to use this. Right? Our position in Christ. Nobody can change that position. Devil comes and tells, you know what, you will always be like this. You are a failure or you will never succeed in what you do. You will never become a pastor. You will never become a prophet. You will never be a worship leader. You will never start your own business. Use your position in Christ. Can the devil take you out of your position and put you somewhere else? What is our position? Ephesians 1, we are seated together with him in heavenly places. Oh, that's a spiritual position, but that's a position that the enemy cannot undo. Unless I myself say, I don't want this position. Right? That's my... If somebody comes up to me and says, I, Paul, I want you to become the governor of Bangalore. Good role. I may not be equipped enough. I'll say, I don't want this position. I don't want No, you must take it. No, I don't want it. The same way, <clears throat> when Jesus died on the cross, there is a position that he has given us. We heard of that song. He's the captain of the host. Right? Jesus, he's the captain of the host is Jesus. We are following in his footsteps. Right? So he's the captain. He's given us all positions in the army, right? Now, let's go on. Page 113. This is where we uh, stopped last class. We are anointed for battle. What does the word anointed mean? What is anointed? We like to use the word. What is the meaning of anointed? Anointed. Sorry? Power and presence. What does it mean to anoint someone? What did Saul do to David? Saul anointed David. It is the pouring out of oil. The Old Testament, oil refers to the Holy Spirit. right? So when we are anointed, it only means the power and the anoint uh, and the, uh, the, the power of the Holy Spirit resting upon us. Right? We are anointed by the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. It is the anointing that destroys yokes and removes burdens. Very important. 
It's not the gifting. It is the anointing. You may be gifted in uh, leading worship. You may be gifted as a pastor. But it's not your gift that will break the yoke. It is not your, your gift or my gift of whatever gifts that God has given us. The gift is only a tool to break the yokes of the enemy. See, God can use a sermon of anyone, a person who's maybe one year in the Lord, anoint that sermon and touch thousands of lives. There's a difference. The anointing makes the difference. You understand? So what should we go after? Gifts or anointing? Gift will be there. But you say, God, the gifts that you have given me, anoint it so that when I am preaching, when I am leading worship, the anointing of the Holy Spirit will go and break burdens, break yokes among people. We cannot do anything. Satan is not going to say, oh, he's singing, he's crying and singing. So sad. No? Jesus is not going to feel sad that you're crying and singing. No. It is the anointing that can touch people's lives and break the yokes. The moment the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes, the devil knows it. Look at Jesus. What did he do? In, in, in the book of Matthew, he was anointed. Immediately he went for the 40 days of fasting. He, then the Bible says he came back under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He, can you picture that? That even when he walked, people could experience the power of God. Peter was walking, his shadows healing people. Nothing about the shadow. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? Isaiah 10.27 says his uh, anointing destroys yokes. Uh, yeah. So the local church must intentionally advance against the gate of, gates of hell. Now, very, very important. I'm, I'm just going to ring, just briefly uh, explain these points. We won't go in detail. See, our goal as a body of Christ is to destroy the power of Satan and to build the kingdom of God. That's our goal as a local church. We are not called to sit back and say, okay, let anything that happens, happens. We are called to take up a stance. It says here, the local church must intentionally advance to the gates of hell. We must use the weapons that God has given us together as a body of Christ, work together and go against the works of the devil. God has given us the authority. Listen to this. Even as I was on the way coming here, listening to this wonderful sermon, and this preacher was preaching, and he's talking about the name of Jesus, the, the person of Jesus. You look back in history, you have great men and women, right? Leaders who started kingdoms, right? Alexander the Great, right? Conquered almost the entire world. You have Hitler, Mussolini, right? They all wanted to become leaders, right? Stalin, Joseph Stalin, all these people, great, great men. They all of them wanted to, you know, abolish Christianity. They didn't like Christianity. They didn't want Christianity. But over all of this, in, in the message, the, it was beautifully it was explained. They came, they conquered for some time, they died and they're gone. Hitler, dead and gone. Mussolini, dead and gone. Joseph Stalin, dead and gone. Alexander the Great, dead and gone. All of them tried to wipe out Christianity. But out of all of this stands the figure of Jesus. They tried to wipe out religion, Christianity, not possible. Even today, the Bible is the highest selling book in the world. There is a reason for it. We are, we belong to the kingdom of God. The enemy will raise up many people. Right? Many of them will come. Many more Hitlers may come. 
many more Joseph Stalins, right? People who are uh, dictators will come up, but they can never stop the work of God. Do you get that? Right? Revolutions may start. We don't in the uh, second coming that there will be the beast and the antichrist. Nothing, whatever the enemy is trying, nothing can stop the local church. Nothing can stop God's kingdom. We are armed, we are dangerous. Now the problem is, we don't know we are armed and dangerous. Right? So, as a local church, we must get together. Now don't go for battle without training. I always say that. If you want to go and fight the enemy, you better be prepared for it. There's a place of preparation. You've got to go back, spend time on your knees, read God's word, spend time in God's prayer. Then you go out for battle. C.D. Studd was a great man of God. He would spend many hours on his knees. And he would, even when he would go to preach, even before he would preach, the anointing would touch people's lives. People would experience the power of God. Right? David Brainard, John Wesley. By the age of nine, John Wesley learned the entire Psalms 119, all 176 verses by heart. Think about that. David Livingston, he also learned the whole thing before 10 years old. We've got men and women of God who are doing some great things. Uh, forget the name. Uh, Adoniram Judson. By the age of nine, nine or ten, he was teaching children's church revelations from the original Greek. Let me tell you something. If you, you and I know what God has given us, really we can make a great impact for God's kingdom. But for that, there's a sacrifice. We will have to sacrifice and then go against the gates of hell right but this should encourage us okay let's look at rank order and discipline in the local church army now just as how in a in a in an in an army there is rank there's order there's discipline right you have the commander lieutenant now, i'm not sure about all of those ranks but there are ranks right then there's order and there's discipline in an army no, I, I would encourage you, uh, actually they don't allow, but yesterday I had to visit a family from church who were admitted in a, uh, you know, an army hospital. Whoa. It's a, it was one of the first few times I went into an army hospital. It is spick and span. There is no, not even a wrapper that is thrown outside. Nothing. Everything, the road is so clean. Everything, it's like a different world altogether. In Bangalore, nobody honks. And you have those army guys walking around. And, and if you're simply, if you're loitering around, they'll keep looking at you. And right at the entrance, there's one guy with a machine gun. He's ready, he's wearing helmet, everything, and he's standing. I, said, I asked him, how do you go to ICU? He's not even responding to me. He's saying, go to the gate. Because he's on high alert. He doesn't want to waste time talking to me. He's on high alert. If somebody comes near the gate, he's just at the gate. And the machine gun, there's a full covering around him and he's sitting there just waiting. But it's a different world altogether. It's not like our regular hospitals. It is a different world altogether. But the way the army and, you know, uh, army, the way they portray themselves is very different. Now, in the local church, we need to keep rank. We need to keep order. Let's read Joel chapter 2, 7 and 8. Let's read that. Let's go a little quick so that we can complete as much as we can. Yes. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. Mm. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons. They are not cut down. Right? So, 
I think even when we were in school, you know, there was this march drills and the march pass. You have to follow, right? You can't say I'm the owner of the school. I'll march the other side. They'll say go. That you keep marching the other way. They don't come back this side. There's rank. There's order. God has set leaders in the local church, and we, as part of the local church, must be willing to recognize these leaders and walk along with them. Right? We need to recognize and order leaders at all levels. Now, when I'm talking about the local church, it can be your church, and then also churches across the city. Right? Citywide churches. But here's the point. We need to recognize and honor leaders in the church. Remember, leaders are also people. They will make mistakes. They go through their ups and downs. Right? They go through challenges. Sometimes if we, you know, people look at leaders and say, oh, everything is you know, okay with them. Or they may feel that you know, um, nothing is wrong in their life. No, we are, we are people. We go through the same challenges that you and I go through. So in a local church, it's important that we recognize and honor the leaders at all levels. It's one thing to recognize, but it's another thing to honor. I can recognize, but not honor. Many people recognize Jesus as a leader. They called him rabbi, but they didn't honor him. You see the difference there? Right? So our submission to leadership he has appointed is essentially our submission to Jesus. Now, Jesus has placed leaders in the local church, and we serve under, the, under those leaders. Now, when we submit to those leaders, it is basically we are submitting to God. We're submitting to Jesus, saying, Lord, you have placed him as a leader. So now I'm submitting to him. I may not agree to everything that they're saying, but I submit to him because it's like I am submitting to God. Right? So there's rank, there's order, there's discipline. Two, there's a military mindset. We need to be on high alert since we are on battle. Right? Uh, we need to be on high alert. We refuse to give enemy any inroads. We refuse to give the enemy any place, any inroad. Right? Always on high alert. We talked about that. Two, we have a military lifestyle. We live as soldiers. While we discharge our earthly duties, we must keep ourselves from being entangled with the affairs of this life. Very important, right? Now, look at a military lifestyle. Are the military guys, you know, worried about what's happening outside of their jurisdiction? No. This is my place. This is the military campus. This is under my control. And I should be on high alert. You know, do you know this? Uh, I think I, I, I don't know if you have ever heard of this, but in Bangalore, I think it was a couple of years, maybe five or six years back, um, there, was a, there, there are many army campuses here. And we, surprisingly, this happened and it, it became a big news in Bangalore. What happened was these youngsters in the night they were you no know, they, they were drunk and all of it and they tried to jump into an army compound now why would they choose an army compound i don't know now, sometimes when you're drunk you don't you do silly things they try to jump over the army compound so these guys in the night they with the you know with the microphone they said get out don't get down from that compound wall they didn't they continued to climb you know what they did they shot them Two boys, they were just shot dead. Next day, army killed two people who were trying to enter into the their compound. Case closed. There's no case itself. Why? Because they're the army. God knows what they are carrying. They are drunk and they're trying to do something. There's no case. Over. It's done. It's finished. Who told you to go near the army quarters, first of all? Right. Don't go. Because they were shot dead. You can't say, how can the army kill? How can they shoot? No. Who told you to go there? They are on high alert. It's midnight. You go to some other neighborhood and do what you want. Then the military don't sleep in the night. Whole night they were on high alert. They shot them. Their parents came and said they wanted to put a case. Nothing will happen. You can't mess with the army. 
you cannot right i know a lot of friends who are in the army their parents are in the army i go to army quarters i've seen the way they live you cannot mess with that have you seen their number plates it's completely different it's not something that we have because they don't go by the rules that we have they have their own set of rules now we have a military lifestyle we don't go by the rules of the of what the enemy is doing around here everyone are doing something so even i want to do no we think and we say okay if i am if i need to develop this military mindset i need to work hard i need to sacrifice i need to spend time it's a rough life it's a hard life right i got to sacrifice i need to put my hand to the plow i got to do things right i'm not entangled with the world what the world is doing now the world is doing many things you know youth are doing many things or you know people are doing many kinds of things now i'm not saying don't enjoy i was sharing with the first year students the other day uh, they were asking me what do you do to you know to spend time are you only praying only 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 reading word nothing else you do is it i said no i i like traveling right um holidays actually if you see i was just checking uh, now it's holidays for the kids i was checking where to go i was just on google thinking where to go so i do enjoy right i go out with family i love driving i go for many many long drives i enjoy driving i've gone bangalore mumbai bangalore uh, 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 ajmer rajasthan i've gone many places driving i can drive the whole day so i can i love certain things but it's not like without that i cannot stay there's a place of sacrifice that's what a military lifestyle is right when we have to come to a place of sacrifice for military discipline we keep our entire spirit soul and body under discipline right spirit soul and body not just body under discipline spirit also our soul also you know sometimes we get up we are in the mood sometimes we get up we are not in the mood yes or no right sometimes you get up okay i want to pray sometimes we get up we don't even feel like praying that's our soul our emotions it goes up up and down but we need to discipline ourselves see this morning i got up with a terrible headache and i can't pray not able to pray but i have to discipline myself i have two choices one is pray and say headache get out in jesus name or two is put some you know lotion on my head and then sleep now the choice is us so i have to learn to discipline my spirit soul and body why do we have a timetable in bible college to discipline so this habit you'll know that okay even when i move out of bible college there's some kind of discipline that's already been inculcated inculcated in you an army has a strategy very important we must be strategic when we go for battles don't just shoot randomly we must be strategic if you look at the old testament god was brilliantly strategic he brought the people out of egypt think of this they are around they just before going into the uh, the to the towards the red sea god brought them to a place if you look to the left there are mountains if you look to the right there are mountains in front of them is the red sea and at the back you've got pharaoh's army coming now tell me where can they run can they run left no how long will it take how far how fast will they run the pharaoh's army will easily catch them can they run right no can they go into the water they'll all die god was strategic there's a reason why he brought them there god could have taken them through another way there's a reason he's very strategic came there there was no way they had to look up god only you can do it now right when um, when um, the israelites were fighting against the amalekites what did god tell when you hear the sound of the mulberry leaves it's time for battle you go 
another place he says as long as moses's hand is up israel will keep winning the battle to gideon he said you don't need 30000 i think it is 40000 people uh, i could be wrong but you can check the number 40000 people to go against the enemy all you need is you first you find out how many people are scared you send them home thousands of them went home now out of these people you ask them to drink water whoever drinks like a dog you send them home whoever takes water in their hand and drinks you keep them 300 people so it was 300 against thousands of people god said 300 is enough you go i'm with you i'm giving you the strategy god told joshua when you go into that from when you're going into the promised land you'll come to a place called jericho there's a wall there i have a strategy don't do it in your own strength you will fail the wall will fall on you and you will die so i will do it my way go around it seven times seven days you see god in the army there's a strategy god also is a very strategic god so when we are working in god's kingdom we must be strategic we must learn how to come up with ideas come up with ways to engage in missions ways to engage people in ministry right ways to ways to engage in the gospel in the gifts of the spirit we must come up with strategies right now remember that the holy spirit is the spirit of wisdom so he can give us opportunities he'll give us the wisdom to handle those opportunities okay. now next one everyone with me right next one an army takes care of its wounded let me tell you something and an army personnel will is ready to give his life for another army person jesus said you know a friend who 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 will who is willing to give their lives for another an army person personnel now have you read about i've read a few articles of uh, what happened at the uh, Taj when the uh, when the terrorists came in I think I've explained this. There's a there's a bench okay uh, in Taj, and this guy, this army guy, saw a wife, and they were not even Indian nationals. They were people from some other country. This woman with two small children was sitting on that bench. Okay, and the and this army guy came in, Bangalorean, right? He came in, uh, and he told them those kids what you do is you go and you you just hide behind this bench because they are coming we can hear the footsteps now there is no choice so what he did was he said okay i will sit here with the gun but you just be behind me and the story goes on where this guy one of the terrorists came shot him but they but he didn't notice those three there those three survived the mother and the two children and that bench is like a memorial right now i think his name is major sandeep i don't know i could be wrong and that bench is a memorial he sacrificed his life for those three people now an army takes care of its wounded if we are going through challenges we are going through difficulties we got to look after each other yes or no right we have to look after each other we cannot look at somebody else and say okay that's his problem right? we will go through problems so, you know there's a saying in leadership leaders are the most lonely people sometimes people say that lonely people so it's very important when we come into place of leadership be able to uh, take care of others and be able to be willing to be taken care of others I've gone, I'm, you know, most of you have heard, right? I went through a, a big loss in my family. Very painful. I remember I just, when I spoke to pastor, I was speaking to him. There are people around me that I can always talk to, right? There's pain, there's struggles that we go through. But that shouldn't stop us from doing what God has called us to do, right? We do not kill our own just because of their failure we help people recover and gain regain strength 
and people fall, we lift them up. And so how, how are some of the ways that we can implement this? Teach people about spiritual authority. Very important. If, I, if we don't, I got to teach people about spiritual authority, right? Uh, the, the cross, our identity, our, the weapons that we have, prayer and intercession, praise and worship. These are all weapons that we have. We have to teach them. Two, teach people how to correctly exercise spiritual authority. Encourage people to engage in prayer and intercession. One of the things I always encourage young people, I always say this when I meet young people, if you want God to use you, if you want God to, you know, use you as a pastor, whatever, especially if God is calling you in ministry, if you want God to use you, you must be spending time in God's presence. Without this, you cannot do it. There's not going to be, we can only last for some time, but we cannot do it. You have to be able to engage in prayer and intercession. Praying for your church, praying for your leaders, praying for your community, you have to engage in it. There's no shortcut in ministry. Unfortunately, there's no shortcut. Uh, gifts and talents, we can achieve it. We can learn, can grow, right? I was never, I'm not a gifted speaker. I'm not a speaker. I'm not a person who can speak public, publicly. Public speaking is never has been my gift. It is not my gift. My gift was maybe music a little bit. But public speaking was never my gift. And there are people in church who know it because we all grew up together. You know, it was never his gift. Gifts can, can be, you know, uh, learned and we can grow in that. But prayer and intercession, that's where is the real battle that we will win. Right? Call for extended times of worship. Set targets as a local church to... Uh, to reach out to people. But there are some challenges. Sometimes people go overboard and become demon conscious. That means what? Now listen, very important. We must be God conscious, not demon conscious. You get what I'm saying? Yes or no? Yes. God conscious means what? I'm always thinking about what God can do. This is what God is able to do. God's power, God's presence, the anointing of His Holy Spirit. That's being God conscious. Demon conscious is, why is the devil doing this? What did the devil do? Why is the devil doing this? Why the devil is behind my life only? Why the devil is not allowing me to grow? Why the That is being demon conscious. We must, so we must be, there, there will be people who will be always, if the phone falls from the table or demon pushed it. If the, if I, if the red signal comes and we have to, you know, we're going to pray, Red signal, if, if there's a stop sign, or oh, the demon has caused this. There are people who say that. Now that light is, uh, signal is working on its own. How will the devil come and affect that light? So sometimes we blame everything on the devil, which is wrong. Devil is one thing, I didn't do anything. That's, that's normal. You get, you, you understand? We must not be demon conscious. What the demon can do. Oh, he's an angel of light. He masquerades like a... It's only for... It's not he is, but think of the bigger picture. He's destroyed. Right? So, don't become spooky spiritual. Don't worry about what the enemy is doing. You shall know the truth. Let the truth set you free. Okay? Now, remember, we are already winners. So, we are fighting from a place of victory. And not for victory right okay any questions before we go we go into the next aspect of the local church okay so how many have we done first one you go to your contents table you can see very clearly there first one the local church is the body of christ secondly the family of god third pillar of truth fourth an army 
So now we're going to look at the fifth aspect, which is the bride. Again, a picture of love, care. Right? Now, one of the most wonderful pictures of the church is the bride. Jesus said, I'm coming for a spotless bride. We, as a local church, is the bride. Right? Now, under the old covenant, he dealt with them based on the law. But under the new covenant, God deals with us based on grace. Not everyone, under the old covenant, not everyone experienced the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. But under the new covenant, everyone enjoys the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, let us look at the aspect of the local church being a bride. How many of you have been to marriage ceremonies? Most of us? Can you go there and keep talking nonsense? Can you go there and you know scream and shout? No, it's a very it's a very, um, you know, it's a beautiful but very holy ceremony. Right? It is a picture of a man and a woman becoming one. Now, this is man and woman. Don't go by what's happening now. Man and man. Adam and, what is that? Adam and Steve. No, no, no. It's always been Adam and Eve. Adam and Madam. Always remember in that way, right? So the local church is a bride. And as a bride, you see, one thing that I've noticed is many, many, many weddings that we have gone through. The bride is beautifully adorned. The guy can wear a jeans pant and a t-shirt also and come. Okay. Of course, they won't wear that. But the emphasis is not on... Too much on the guy. Right? The emphasis is on the woman, on the bride. I don't know if it happens in, uh, you know, for my wedding. After, I, after the, even before the reception, I was walking around in that hall because I was very hungry. I wanted to eat something. So I went and started eating. You're the, you're the groom, no? Yeah, that's the bride. Right is getting ready. Okay, eat. <laughs> so we started eating. We ate. It was as if I was attending that program. And I went back on the stage. The bride came. Oh, everyone started bursting balloons, doing all of that. Finished. We all ate. Went home. Some people didn't even know that I was the groom. There was no emphasis. Now, the point of all of this is, when Jesus is coming, he's coming for a bride. It's a, it's, a, it's a union. So, the love of your betrothal. God talks about when, uh, in, uh, uh, the day when Israel was betrothed, means engaged to him. The kindness, the love, the pursuit that they demonstrated. Right? His first, Israel was betrothed to him in Mount Sinai in the wilderness after he bought them, brought them out of Egypt. You see that picture here. Then later on in the book of Hosea, he says, you call me my husband. Hosea chapter 2, 16 and 17. Shall we read that? Again, everyone know the story of Hosea, right? Yes. God tells the prophet Hosea, go and marry a prostitute because he wanted him to, in his life, portray the relationship of God and Israel as a nation, right? as a husband and a wife. Yes, go ahead. Hosea 2, 16 and 17. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals and they shall be remembered by their name no more. Now, this is talking about the nation of Israel, which he is betrothed to, which he is engaged to. Now, the Lord Jesus as a groom or God as the groom and we are the bride, there are some things that he expects from us. One, as a devoted wife, God expects us faith to be faithful and not going after other gods. But we see in the book of Hosea and all through the Old Testament, the people of Israel kept going 
to other gods. They were always, their minds were, you know, they, they, they saw the miracles, they wanted God, but they also wanted the other things. Do you know why? Because they could not keep the law. It was too much for them. Numbers 23 onwards, you see, that is a mockery of what, of God's word, of God's uh, plans for the nation of Israel. They made a mockery out of it, especially Balaam. He says, he wanted to go and curse. Balak is saying, come and curse. And, and in the end, he didn't curse, but he told the people, the, the, the Moabites, if you get into, send your women to the Israelite camp. And when you send your women, the Israelites are weak. The women will deceive them. They will fall into temptation. And they will, they will sin. And God will bring a curse upon them. See, he did not curse Israel, but he taught Balak, the Amalekites, how, sorry, the Moabites, how to curse the nation of Israel. God is saying, I've called you my husband. Right? And you, sorry, you call me my husband. That means you are my, as a wife, as a bride, you have to be faithful. There's a few more things here. Let me, let's just go there. The bullet points. You are, we are his forever. He draws us to himself in holiness and purity. And he looks at the whole, the local church. He draws us to himself in holiness. He's a God of justice. God delivers us from every form of oppression and injustice. As a local church, God will deliver us from oppression and injustice. God extends his love and kindness to us. He is faithful. He's a faithful love. He brings us into a place of intimacy with himself. And you see this picture in the, in the book of Revelations as well. Paul is writing and also as well, uh, and he's saying, when the rapture happens, you and I as a church are taken up and we'll be with him in the clouds. We will see him face to face, a picture of intimacy. Can we see him face to face now? But a picture of intimacy is we will stand on the clouds. We will see him face to face with glorified bodies, right? So uh, he brings us into this place of intimacy. Even as we as a local church, we spend time in God's presence. We read God's word. It's a place of intimacy. God speaks to us, right? We are building a relationship. And that intimate relationship is very strong. We, we should not allow the enemy to cause that intimacy to be broken off. Place of intimacy. Right? Okay, so we'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll start from the next point.